Before I start uh, the introduction, introduction of our speaker, let me thank a few people who made this event possible. First, uh, students who are working here hard to get everything organized for us. Nanya, if you are here, just raise your hand, let me see you. Uh, Grant, Diego, Akshay, Brett, Patrick, <laughs> Alex, Luigi, and Lauren. These are great students that help us with the events, and I want to thank them. Uh, and thank Nancy Dan Donovan, our ev special event coordinator, who supervises these students. Today, also, I want to thank uh, Natalie Derdak, who is communication manager for our college and publicizes the event. And uh, thank you again for being here. I, I'm looking forward to this presentation. Dr. Toby Groves is a social cognitive scientist, uh, speaker, and writer. His research focus is on higher order critical thinking, problem solving, and communications. His work with experts in audit, in intelligence, investigation, legal, and medical communities. He has a PhD in psychology and a Master of Art in Industrial Organization Psychology. He's also a unique combination of forensic psychologist and forensic accountant. So we have everything here tonight. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Welcome to LMU. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I've got this. I'm good. Hi. So um, my name is Toby Groves, um, good evening. I study, um, well, essentially I study the brains of experts, um, particularly teams. And what I'm fascinated by uh, are teams of experts like surgical teams, um, flight crews, and uh, audit teams. And what I'm interested in is when everything is going their way, but a disaster happens, or everything's working against them, and somehow they're able to adapt and solve problems. And what's the difference, right? What's the difference between the psychology that's going on under the surface uh, in these teams that causes these things, these differences to happen? So one of the things that I, I spend a lot of my life studying is uh, skepticism and how we interpret uh, evidence. So skepticism, um, a lot of people are taught, especially experts and auditors, are taught that it is high, having a higher degree of uh, questioning mind right, before you believe something, not just accepting something at face value. And when I talk to uh, auditors and other experts all around the country, that's pretty much what they tell me, is that they want to avoid believing something when it isn't actually true. This is a false positive. It's a type one error. A false negative or a type two error is just as dangerous, just as problematic. So we're gonna dig into a little bit behind that and some stories uh, of how uh, in the real world, things like that have gone. I'm going to talk to you about um, some ways that you can view it, and I want to go over a couple of things with you that I've done with expert groups around the country uh, that I uh, presented to them as part of my doctoral dissertation. I'm going to try it with you and, uh, and see what you think of it. So one thing that I want to start with is, uh, especially since I'm in the Los Angeles area, is a story that has fascinated me for a very long time. Uh, does anybody know what this is? This is uh, a kuros, you know, right? Um, so a kuros, a symbol of youth in ancient Greece. Uh, this piece was offered to the J. Paul Getty Museum in September of 1983. It created a crisis in the field of arts and antiquities. And it's an epic lesson for all of us 
in looking at how do we know if what we're looking at is really what we think it is, right? So there are only 200 of these known to exist on Earth. And perhaps none of them, though, in as good a shape as this one. So the J. Paul Getty Museum, realizing that this was going to be perhaps the most important piece of art that would come into the United States since World War II, they were excited to get a hold of this piece. And outside of that field of arts and antiquities, a lot of people didn't know anything about it. Um, unless you're a, a fan of Malcolm Gladwell, he started one of his books, I think it was Blink, on this piece. So what kind of tools would they use, right? They're gonna go through an authentication process. What kind of tools would they use? And, and whatever you do, right, you're gonna use tools, right? Audit teams use tools. Uh, or technology, uh, as do all types of other professions. In this profession, what would they use to authenticate this piece? Carbon dating, right? And carbon dating said that this piece was from about 530 BC. Falls into the range of expectation. They used mass spectrometry, which would allow them to take a sample of the stone, which is marble, and source it back to almost the exact spot that it came from. And they sourced it to an island off the coast of Greece. All of the science said that this piece is authentic. And after a 14-month intensive examination, the Getty bought this piece for about $9 million. And that's when things started to get just a little bit messy. You see, they started looking and comparing it to other cry. And they realized, well, first of all, what's with this chalky coating? That's unusual. Shouldn't it be shiny? And then they realized that look at the hair and the torso and the feet. What it appears is that somebody has taken their favorite pieces, kind of a conglomeration of all their favorite pieces, of different curai through hundreds of years. But of course that would be impossible because that would mean it was a forgery. And this piece can't be a forgery because it's too perfect, it's too beautiful. There's no one been alive for such a long time that would have the ability to create something like this. And then the former director of the New York Met saw it and said, um, have you paid for this yet? Because if you haven't, don't. If you have, you might want to try to get your money back. Somebody else saw it, another expert, and said, anybody that's seen these come from the ground knows that this thing didn't. So they started doing a little more research. They looked at some of the documentation that came with the piece that would indicate kind of proving the custody chain and a letter was in there, and it, the letter mentioned a bank account. And a, upon examination, they realized that this bank account mentioned in the letter didn't exist for 20 years after the letter was written. The postal stamp, the code, postal code on the outside of the envelope didn't exist for 15 to 20 years until after the letter was supposedly mailed. Now they're concerned, right? Now they're worried. And it becomes then a problem of, of what do you believe? Do you believe the science? Or do you believe the softer information? And I think it's a mixture. Okay. I'll tell you um, how things ended up with the Kurai before, the, this Kuros, before we walk out of here. But first, I would like to do a little test with you. What I'm gonna need you to do is I want you to pay close attention to the screen where I am going to flash a number of words to you. And all I want you to do is I want you to do your best to remember those words. I don't want you to write them down. Please don't cheat by videoing it with your phone. Simply remember them, hold them up here 
You are going to have to pay close attention because they're going to flash kind of fast on the screen. And then when we're done, I'm going to go around the room and we're going to see who remembers the most words. Are you ready? Here we go. Now, as fast as you can, if you would, please name the days of the week to yourself in alphabetical order. It's a little more challenging than at first it might seem. Now, you probably haven't had time, and I apologize for that. What I'd like you to do is as fast as you can, as fast as you can, name to yourself, name to yourself a color. As fast as you can, name to yourself a tool you'd find in your household toolbox. Now, if you named your color, you named your household tool, raise your hand if this looks familiar to you. Oh, a lot of you, a lot of you. Is that odd? Right? How could I read your mind? I didn't. I know that in every part of your life, everything that you do in your life, everything that you come across, you put into categories. And now you've built thousands and thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of categories. And at the top of every one of those categories is your default judgment. It's what's going to pop out under pressure. Okay? Why did I ask you to name the days of the week to yourself in alphabetical order? because I knew it would tax your conscious mind so I could have access to your subconscious. The problem is that when things are going normally, that default judgment is frequently the right choice. But when things are a little bit weird, which is when pressure is applied, when your judgment is really needed, that's when that default judgment frequently is the wrong choice. And we're going to be digging into how that works, the psychology behind it, so you can avoid those types of errors. Now, it wasn't very nice of me, was it, that I led you astray from remembering the words? Do you remember them? The best way for me to do this is I will name out some of the words, and you just be honest and raise your hand if you remember it. Okay? We will start with window. Raise your hand if you remember the word window. Well, overwhelming, yes, good. What about the word open? Remember the word open? Okay, good, but I'll, about half as many, right? Much fewer. View. Still much, many fewer, but a lot of you remember that. Now let me challenge you for a second. Could I get you to question in fact, let me tell you that, in fact, I'm going to challenge you and say that none of those words that you just think you saw were up there. Huh? So, so now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. If you, let's, if you saw the word window, raise your hand again. If you saw the word, if you raised your hand for window, raise your hand again. That's fewer hands, first of all. Come on now. Own it. The word window was not there. The word open was there. And so was the word view. But in this group and every other group that I've done this with, more people remember or think they remember seeing the word window. Why? Associations, right? I'm hearing that word, right? A lot of those words were associated with it. But let's dig a little deeper. It's not just because those words were associated, right? That's not the main point that I'm trying to tell you. Main point is that what you remember is what has meaning to you, not the raw data, right? That changes your interpretations. It changes even what you pay attention to. If you have a decision tree and you're working down that decision tree, what are you going to work with? The raw data or what you remember? 
what you remember. We have to get to the meaning area of the brain. And that's a different part of the brain than what handles logic. Different areas of the brain handle counting numbers versus understanding what those numbers mean. Right? So what we know from this is that the associations that we make are more important than the actual stimuli that we come across. So let's talk a little bit about the neuroscience. The very conscious areas of the brain, right, in the cortex, the outer areas of the brain, handle logic, planning, motivation, and if you keep following it around, very conscious areas still, language, logic and language. That area does not handle what you believe. Anything you believe, everyone that you trust, must pass through the area that you see in purple there, part of the limbic system and associated networks. That's what handles what you believe. And it has no ability to handle language at all. That's why you can have somebody give you a logical, step-by-step -step explanation of something, and you can understand every single step of it. But when you get to the end, something just doesn't seem right to you, and you have trouble articulating it because that part of the brain doesn't handle language. We have to incubate a little bit on it to be able to figure out what we're dealing with, right? To be able to take it to a different level to gain insight, not just logic, right? So different areas of the brain, if they don't match, because what I'm telling you is that you can logically understand something that you don't believe. That's what I'm telling you. And to help pull that out of you, kind of tease that feeling out of you, because I want you to relate to that, what that feeling is like, I have another test for you. On the next screen, I'm going to show you a series of letters and the different, different sets of letters that are going to be printed in different colors. And what I'd like you to do is I would like you to recite, to stop at the, start at the top left, recite to yourself the color that the first set of letters is printed in. Go to the next set of letters, recite to yourself the color that those letters are printed in. And continue down the page from top left to bottom right. Now, I am going to warn you ahead of time. There are words on this page. And I will implore you, do not read the words. Right? Those are simple instructions. I'm sure you can follow them. Are you ready? Here we go. Right? <laughs> and it gets a little hard around line three, am I right? In fact, <laughs> really hard around line three. It slows you down, but why? Why do you slow down at line three? Why do you think that happens? Why is it so difficult? It's because you are logically trying to convince yourself of something that your brain has already decided it doesn't believe. Because the areas that handle logic are slower than the areas that handle what things mean. And even further down, the conditioned areas of the brain, habituated, right, conditioned areas. You are conditioned to read words. You can't help it. No matter how much I tell you don't read those words, you're going to read them. And it's going to happen faster than the logical part of trying to argue with yourself about the color. When those things don't match, there's a problem, right? It causes, in some people, some discomfort. Now, there's a group of people that would have no problem with this. They would zoom down through there, saying their colors, those colors, and without uh, reading the words, right? Who would zoom down through there and beat all of us? Little kids that don't know how to read yet. Right? but know their colors, right? because the conflict doesn't exist. Now, when it comes to this new studies and research and skepticism, what they're saying is that a lot of professionals, experts, they're so conditioned to look at things the way that they look at them, right? using the tools that they use, 
that if they were needing to look at it from a different perspective, this would happen. Right? It would bias them in their interpretation and even what they notice uh, and how they are able to interpret the evidence going forward. So the different areas of the brain would look at the association areas that are deeply subconscious. Right? And then other areas of the brain that handle more conscious activities. And then we have areas of the brain that near the brain stem that are even more deeply subconscious, right? that we have trouble grasping, even knowing about. And these different levels of cognition can come up with different assumptions. And these assumptions that you make can have profound influences on the way your critical thinking works, the way skepticism works. Um, business students, many of you, you know who this is, right? Sure. The Oracle, Alan Greenspan. Ten years ago, um, actually last month, ten years ago, August or October 23rd, 2008, Alan Greenspan sat in front of a congressional panel explaining just how the most talented group of analysts, economists, auditors right, at, that worked at the Federal Reserve, most talented group they thought in the world, could possibly have missed what in hindsight seemed like the obvious signs of the impending global financial meltdown. Alan Greenspan said that day something that amazed me. I was glad he said it. Probably one of the most honest things he ever said. He said, quite frankly, I'm shocked to find out that the markets don't work according to my lifelong assumptions. I don't think the answer, he said, is more regulation, more data, more technology. The answer is that we must learn to safeguard ourselves against our own false assumptions. And so let's take a look, a deeper look, at these assumptions. And I'll tell you a little story um, behind this really briefly. Um, this research is deeply, deeply personal to me. Um, I had an autistic son that had a very unusual form of synesthesia. Um, and when it comes to somebody that, is, that studies psychology and spends their life studying psychology, it turned out to be uh, extra fascinating. Um, because a part of his brain called the reticular activating system didn't work quite right. The reticular activating system is uh, networks that start around the brain stem and they are your filter, what you're gonna pay attention to and, and what you won't. One of the best examples I've ever heard of it is this. You're shopping for something, let's say it's a car. You have six or seven makes and models of cars that you're interested in. You boil it down to two or three and then finally there's one that you think, this is the car I want. And all of a sudden, you realize that you're noticing many more of those cars on the road than you did before. They were there before, you just didn't notice them, right? So the reticular activating system is your filter. It tells you when something is important, right? This is relevant, pay attention. Because you can't take in everything, it would overwhelm you, right? It would overwhelm your, your senses. And if you, undoubtedly in this room, um, people know plenty of autistic people. And you know that many times that their sensory perceptions um, get taken over and they might uh, hold their ears or close their eyes, uh, resort to repetitive behaviors uh, and try to close out the outside world. Right? So his, um, his reticular activating system didn't didn't help filter stuff out. So he was overwhelmed um, much of the time that he was conscious. And it was hard on him. And he used to travel with me to all of my talks. A few years ago, unfortunately, I lost him to suicide. But he left me with an incredible um, lifelong journey of research uh, that he taught me because this very unusual form of synesthesia. Synesthesia is when your sensory uh, systems kind of get crossed, the wires get crossed. So uh, somebody might see colors when they hear music or see colors in certain letters or numbers and it's automatic, they can't help it. 
His was a tactile synesthesia from the best we can tell that he believed that he felt thoughts. And he said he could tell in the vibrations that went up through his brain when things didn't match. And in describing this to me, um, I based my doctoral dissertation on what I learned from him. And it has a lot to do with uh, placebo levels and, and the ways that we uh, think at different levels of consciousness. So starting with a conditioned, he called them lenses. Um, and he said, uh, starting with the uh, conditioned lens, right, that, that reticular activating system, he said it, this, this filter, right, it's very fast, uh, determines what you'll pay attention to. So you might consider this like your values. Where the emotional lens, like that purple area that we looked at before, right, where belief is born, right, belief and trust, um, it's, uh, while conditioned lens is deeply subconscious, think Pavlov's dogs. The emotional lens is pre-conscious and conscious. So pre-conscious are those things that um, they're there, and if I remind you of it, you can, you can retrieve it. Right? That would be pre-conscious. And then there's the logical lens, right? Uh, conscious processes, uh, logical and linear thinking, um, and it is the slowest and it's more objective information. And he said, when these things uh, don't match, right? When some people, when their assumptions of the world don't match what seems to be happening in front of them, they get very uncomfortable. Other people seem to get curious. And it has a lot to do with uh, um, this research. Uh, Carol Dweck out of um, Stanford has done some wonderful research in this area on the growth versus the fixed mindset. And so what he was teaching me was, he was saying that some people, uh, if they have a great amount of discomfort when things don't match what they expect or their assumptions, right, these people are more likely to be fixed mindsetters. If you're a fixed mindsetter, you think probably the people's abilities don't change very much, um, which means that you're not gonna step out and accept new challenges because you might fail. And if, you, if your abilities can't change, a failure is an indictment of who you are as a person. It's not an opportunity to grow. Right? So a fixed mindset or new challenges are a threat. Right? You won't own your mistakes. And that's something that affects the way that you interpret evidence. You, if you're a fixed mindsetter, you might force yourself to interpret evidence the way that you expected it to be. How profoundly would this impact your skeptical judgment? Obviously, right? Growth mindsetters, um, failures are, are an opportunity to learn. You're not worried about somebody challenging your beliefs. You're not worried about that because if you find out you're wrong, it's okay. You've grown from the process. Right? So with that, let's leave that there for a second. And let's go another step further. Skeptical judgment. Skepticism, I told you a lot of experts believe that it is not wanting to believe something is true when it's really not, right? We're talking about the type one, type two error. But if you have a little background in statistical analysis, you know that uh, you cannot eliminate both a type one and a type two error. There's an even trade-off between them. So the type one, a false positive, or did finding a pattern that doesn't exist. Type two, false negative, failing to detect a pattern that does exist. Right? And it relies on your signal to noise ratio which a lot of this is determined by your reticular activating system, what you allow in and, and what you don't, what you see as relevant and what you don't, right? So if your signal to noise ratio is too low, you will miss obvious patterns. If it's too high, you will see false patterns everywhere, right? What causes these pattern detection errors? Right? Mismatches in these lenses. So there's a trade-off between type one and type two errors, and this is an easy way to think about it. The more evidence that you require to believe something is true, obviously at the same time, the greater the chance that this thing is true and you just don't believe it yet. Right? The opposite exists as well. 
you might uh, accept something easily and incorrectly accept something as true with very little evidence, right? A type one error. So if you are in the, the a marine environment, I use this as kind of an example of the signal to noise ratio. If you are in a marine environment uh, and you have a signal, something that you want to see, what would they use? Radar, right? They're going to use radar. Let's say it's getting foggy, it's getting dark. They're going to use radar. And on the left side of the screen here, let's say that in the white circles are the targets you want to be able to see, and you're having trouble seeing them a little bit. So kind of like a squelch on a radio, radio, uh, radio um, they have uh, on their radar uh, a C noise, right? You can turn up or down the noise, right? So if you uh, l close it off a little bit, right, then on the right side of the screen there, you see, right, they cut out some of the noise, and you can see these targets now. Now here's, here's the interesting thing I want you to remember about this. If I open that all the way up and I let all the information in, right, what's gonna happen is that that screen is gonna turn all red and it's not gonna help me at all. If I turn everything out, it's gonna turn black and that's not gonna help me at all. I have to have that right signal to noise ratio and it's gonna depend on your situation. Because if I want to see further out, right? Let's say I want to see waves that are higher than three to five feet, maybe a squall line that's coming. I'm going to have to t have to let a little more information in. I can see further into the distance, but I might not be able to see things up close. I turn some of that information out, right? And then I can see things up close, but not further away. Moral of the story, you cannot just let, set your dials and leave them there. You're going to have to look at things from different perspectives. Data scientists tell me they constantly do this. Let more data in, change up the data set, right? Take different sets of it, analyze it, take the whole thing, right? Close it down, open it up, look at it from all kinds of different perspectives. This is a good way to think. And here's um, something that I did as part of my uh, dissertation um, with uh, mostly auditors um, in a variety of professions that, that audited in a variety of, of uh, industries around the country. I want you to imagine that I have dealt you out four cards. You see them in front of you, A, K, 8, and 5. I've dealt you out these four cards out of a deck of 52. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a rule that applies to these cards. And what I want you to do is draw a sample of two of the cards to turn over to tell me whether the rule is true or not. Here's the rule. And before I tell you, what I would like you to do is as soon as you understand what the rule is, I want you to yell out to me as fast as you can which two cards you would turn over. I don't want you to use what I did in the research, card one, two, three, and four. I want you to yell out A, K, eight, five, whichever of those two you would turn over. Here's the rule. If there is a vowel on one side of the card, there will be an even number on the other side of the card. Which two cards do you turn over to tell me whether that rule's true or not? I heard a lot of A and 8, and I heard a couple of other things. So raise your hand if you say A and 8. Majority. A and K? Have a couple. K and 8? A and 5? 8 and 5? Okay. So I'll tell you what we'll do. Figuratively speaking, at least, I'm going to turn these over one at a time, and we're going to see what we learn from them. Let's say I turn over the A, and there is an even number on the other side. What have you just learned? Does it confirm the rule? It doesn't confirm it, except for that one card. 
it is support that the rule might be true. And what we're doing is we're, we're doing something called the Wasson selection task, which tests your hypothesis testing skills. Right? If I turn over the K and there's an even number on the other side of that, then what? It, what? Disconfirmation. Disconfirmation works against the rule. Do you all agree with that? So most of us think it's just natural that if I tell you this is supposed to have this, you're going to feel like the opposite of it shouldn't. But the K is totally irrelevant. The rule said nothing about consonants. Right? And this is where we get led down this path, right, where we start considering either less relevant or irrelevant evidence when we're trying to make a skeptical judgment. If I turn over the eight and there is a vowel on the other side, what then? More support. And that's all it is. Is there anything that I can do 100% with the information given? Is there? Sure there is. If I turn over the five, and there is a vowel on the other side of the five, you have 100% disconfirmed that rule. And this is a really difficult task. It feels really difficult until you understand the way you should look at it. And it is this. Make sure that anything that you are investigating, that you look at evidence that has the power to both confirm and disconfirm whatever it is you're looking at. So if I give you an if-then statement, right, in logic they would say, you know, you would want to uh, affirm the antecedent and disaffirm the consequent. What we usually do, though, is fall prey to confirmation bias. Right, so if I give you an if-then statement, 80 to 90 percent of the people will immediately say A and 8 when I give them the rule. Now here's another aspect to this that I think you're going to find fascinating. At least I'm a nerd with this, so I find it extremely fascinating, okay? Um, so this is what we call a content-independent task, right? There's no context. It is rule-based. But what if I give you something like this? Here you have, on one side of the card, it says whether a check is over or under $2,000. On the other side of the card, it says whether that check has one or two signatures. And the rule is this. If a check has, is over $2,000, it will have two signatures. Now, which two cards would you be interested in turning over if you're auditing an organization, making sure that they're following the rules? Well, you definitely want to look at checks over $2,000, right? So card one. How obvious is it that card two is now irrelevant? Right? When a check is under 2,000, the rule said if a check is over 2,000, it has two signatures. You don't care about card two now. And it's more obvious than in the previous example. What is this telling you? That if you are giving a rule-based structure something to work by, turn it into something contextual so you can make decisions on it. It also tells you if you are using decision tools, blind decision tools that are just rules based. What you are doing is when you use that is you are relying on whoever drew up that tool, whether it's a checklist or whatever it is, to have thought of everything and that's impossible because they aren't in the context that you are. Right? We need your judgment applied to this, not just following the rules blindly. Um, card number three, the check has two signatures. You don't need to turn that one over, right? What you would really want to turn over is card number four, check has one signature, because maybe you turn that over and you see that it was a check over $2,000. Again, always look for confirming and disconfirming evidence. Most of us fall prey to that, where we only look for confirmation. Right? And part of this, what's behind this, is we have this emotional need for certainty. Right. We search for a level of certainty that doesn't even exist in the real world, and we 
assign so much weight to these uh, assumed outcomes, to our assumptions, to automatic character assessments of other people, that it profoundly biases our judgment, our critical thinking, results in automatic assumptions and predictions that continue us down the same course and causes susceptibility to seek subliminal, incorrect subliminal information. Um, and it's the really based, um, it says bias, but on this need for certainty and um, our personal need for structure, how much certainty we each need in our lives. So when we have uh, strong, very strong initial views about something, right, then our subsequent views are going to be resistant to change. It's going to change the way that we interpret everything after that because we're going to try to force it to fit our views. And when new information meets our prior beliefs, we are going to typically, when something meets our assumptions, it gets a free pass. If it doesn't meet our assumptions, we, are, uh, we scrutinize that more heavily. That's a biased process, right? And we call it biased processing of disconfirming information. You also have to realize that when no initial view is present, you don't have a strong view about something, um, you are actually at the mercy of the way the other party frames the problem to you. So what would you do? You would try to reframe the problem in any way that you can to look at it from another perspective. This might be the perspective of another person. It might be um, using different data, right? Some way to look at the information uh, differently. When it comes to people, um, this is uh, really interesting. The study that was done, and the way we do a study like this is I might show you um, a picture of somebody, just a tenth of a second, right? Just flash it on the screen, and then I start asking them questions, right? Um, this person, do you think they uh, are a white collar worker or a blue collar worker? And you can answer pretty quickly, it's easy. Based on that, do they drive a Mercedes or a pickup truck? You can answer that. Then I can go towards what part of town do they live in? Picture their house. And then it's just a short step to, are they Republican, Democrat, Independent? They go to church on Sunday? And then we're down to, you can tell me what kind, specifically, what kind of judgment somebody might make, even though you don't know them, right? So we found that with a tenth of a second, people have you know, certain judgments, right? Within a tenth of a second, the time I stood up here, you judged me on a variety of characteristics. I did the same to you. You did it to each other, we can't help it. What we'd like to think though, is that if we give people enough time, right, we took it at one second, and then we found that even unlimited time, uh, time to look at the situation didn't change people's impressions. We would hope that at some point, somebody's gonna say, oh my God, what am I doing? Of course I do not know this person this well. But overwhelmingly, we do not. We don't do that. It comes to skeptical judgment, this is um, a really wonderful story that I think is uh, extremely instructive. Um, this is Raymond Kelly, who was the head of, uh, he was the NYPD commissioner for longer than anyone else. But what a lot of people, actually two different times, what a lot of people don't remember is that between his stints as NYPD commissioner, he uh, ran Customs and Border Control, U.S. Customs and Border Control. And what he noticed was that they used 43 different suspicious traits, right, criteria, characteristics, to decide who they were gonna search as drug smugglers. Things like, uh, did they wear, wear baggy clothing or tight clothing? What was their race? Um, did they seem nervous? Uh, on and on and on, 43 different traits. And he said, you know, you're doing a lot of searching. 
doing a lot of searches because you're using all of these criteria, do you realize that some of these are unstable criteria that you're using? Meaning that they are just as likely to point you to the direction of somebody who's not smuggling drugs as somebody who is. A couple of the things that they used was, did they make a phone call before or after boarding? Did they use the bathroom before or after boarding? And pretty easy to look at and say, it's like, wait a minute, do you realize that people that use the bathroom after deplaning aren't always smuggling drugs, right? Maybe they just need to go to the bathroom. And he said, what we're going to do is we're going to cut this down to six criteria, stable criteria like, does the drug sniffing dog raise an alarm? Something's probably up if the drug sniffing dog raises an alarm. Was contraband found that might implicate somebody? That's stable criteria, right? Things that when you find them, they overwhelmingly point to what you are interested in. He, when he changed the 43 down to six criteria, their searches decreased 75% but they were focused on the right things, so their successful seizures increased 25%. Didn't cost them a dime, just in the way that they were thinking. One um, very popular thing uh, in fraud investigations is to use red flags. It's a tool uh, that uh, fraud investigators use, right? They look at red flags, and this is, um, the report to the nations from the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, they print every year behavioral red flags displayed by perpetrators, saying 92% has one or more of these. I'm not picking on the ACFE. They have a lot of great research. Um, this, I just don't think, is one of them. And a lot of us fall prey to this. We pray to this. We all try to do these things, right, to try to make it easier to make these decisions. So if you look at these, though, which ones do you think are stable versus unstable? So I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to read them all to you. Um, you see them there, but I'm going to tell you what I think. And it's probably not just one, but there's a constellation of them that I'm interested in. So let's say somebody um, has past employment-related problems coupled with past legal problems. They have an unusually close association with a vendor or customer and they refuse to take a vacation, indicating that they don't want other people taking over their work while they're on vacation. They don't want them to see it, right? If those things happen, I'm interested. But what about some of the other things? Divorce or family-related problems, like nobody has those, right? Unless you're committing fraud, right? Does that help us? I'm gonna argue no. Um, irritability, <laughs> and what can happen is it can hide biases that you have um, towards someone because then you're going to be like somebody that you maybe question already anyway, and like you're going to be more sensitive if you think they're irritable, right? You're going to think, oh, look, they're irritable, I'm going to add that in, right? And one of the... Um, Examples that I, I use when it comes to looking at these sorts of things and how it affects investigations is the case of the Atlanta, um, the Centennial Park bombing during the Atlanta Olympics in 1996. So, right, a call comes into 911 saying uh, there's a bomb in Centennial Park, you have 30 minutes, right? So, before any word can reach the AT&T Sound and Light Tower, where Richard Jewell is a uh, security guard, he notices an unattended backpack. He calls the Georgia Bureau of Investigation officer in the area, says, you better call bomb technicians to come and take a look at this. While the bomb technicians are on the way, he starts evacuating the area. The bomb goes off 10 minutes early in 20 minutes instead of 30, killing two people, injuring 111 and he's hailed as a hero. He saved countless lives by evacuating that area. He's on all the talk shows in the morning. He's on the Today Show and Good Morning America and everything. And while he's on those talk shows, a call is coming into the FBI in Atlanta from the president of Piedmont College, who says, you might wanna 
not just automatically believe everything this Richard Jewell guy says, because when he was a policeman at Piedmont College, he didn't exactly have the best record. It prompted the FBI to run a background check on Richard Jewell. And the agents that were handling the case at the same time remembered a recent case then that happened in California of a volunteer firefighter setting fires and then putting them out to appear to be a hero. Oh, they thought, maybe Richard Jewell has done this. He would have had time to make the 911 call to go and start evacuating the area and look like a hero. So that's the course that they followed. And while that's happening, then his background check comes in showing that he had been arrested a few years earlier for impersonating a police officer. That filled in the gaps for them, right? It's Richard Jewell. And now on all the talk show, on all the news, right? He's not a hero anymore. He's the main suspect in the bombing. But he wasn't the bomber. Many years later, Eric Rudolph admitted to the Centennial Park bombing. But what happened was every part of the interpretation of the evidence was swaying them. Availability bias started swaying them because the availability of the facts of what happened in California case of the volunteer firefighter swayed their judgment. And then they started making assumptions, right? And at the belief level of assumption, right, if you want to believe that the motivation is to look like a hero, who else are you going to look at other than a Richard Jewell? To go down into the reticular activating system level, right, the deepest assumptions, which is where some of our worst mistakes happen, it would be questioning whether profiling is really the right thing to use in this case. Because profiling says you can use personality characteristics to predict somebody's specific behaviors. More and more, the field of psychology is going towards situational factors instead of personality characteristics because of something we call attribution error. We attribute a lot of characteristics to people when they're not really accurate. So we have to let go of a lot of sacred cows. Something that um, is also heavily used in um, fraud investigations particularly, and there are things like this in all the professions, um, is the fraud triangle. Right, so um, pressure, rationalization, and opportunity. What I want you to do, I think you can tell already, is to challenge yourself and challenge the criteria, challenge the tools. Don't blindly follow what you're given, right? Because a lot of the new auditors, new accounting business majors, when they graduate, right, they're put into situations, and I see it. I see senior people put new, newly graduated um, professionals in an industry into situations that keeps the seniors safe and puts the new people in harm's way. Right. And they give them tools like this to use and it can hide your own biases when you really don't even realize it. Pressure. Do you know that some people need none? Other people would have to, it would have to be a situation where somebody might have their child needs life-saving surgery that they can't afford. And of course, I'm not saying that that makes it okay. I'm saying that if you are analyzing pressure, that remember, it goes on a continuum from zero to 100. Rationalization, some people don't need it at all. It's a game for them. Other people, it would have to be to some very, very high level, right? Another continuum. Opportunity. Some people, that's what they wait for, right? An opportunity, they're looking. They're working hard at it. Other people might not have any interest in it, but something falls in their lap on a silver platter just at the right time. You have a triad now of things that are on continuums that have to line up at the perfect point. 
but you can see where attribution error, right? What you believe about people, what you might assume about situations can cause you to see things that aren't really there. Challenge yourself, question the criteria. Don't follow along blindly when you're out there. Hindsight bias as well as attribution error. When things occur, right, it makes it seem, it's natural for us to believe that it should have been easily predicted. And so a lot of cases then we can put into um, things like the, the fraud triangle and see it's like, oh yeah, I can see where that fits. But does it help you predict new things? Many times not, because the context is different. So what we should be looking for are situational factors instead. Right? Um, so uh, particularly in fraud, I teach them pay attention not only when the pressures exist, like meeting debt covenants or sales projections, or when business challenges occur, when those pressures exist, how are decision makers, executives, managers uh, dealing with it? Are those responses met realistically or are they over-optimistic? Are they overconfident? It might not be some where somebody is intending anything, but they start falling down a path that's going to lead to trouble. How good are we? at distinguishing truth from deception when it comes to skepticism, we're not very good. Not very good at all. In fact, what we do in uh, research like this is we would show short video clips of people either lying or telling the truth and ask them to use all of their judgment to see what they thought, right? What they believed. And college students, uh, CIA, FBI, military, police investigators, trial judges, and psychiatrists. None of them rank higher than chance, better than, even better than the flip of a coin. You can get in the 50% range flipping a coin. To prove it, some researchers did the same research using monkeys, and they did just as well as humans. Right? Only US Secret Service agents did better. I've had the honor of addressing some Secret Service agents in my audiences. I got to talk to some of them afterwards, and I asked them, first of all, are you, are you disappointed? That's not exactly 95% accuracy. You're not even to two-thirds. Does that bother you? I was really interested in this answer, and I got everything I had hoped for, because one of them said, no, because that's not what this is about. And I said, what, what is it about? He said, well, you have to realize that what I am after is not proving myself right, but the truth. And those things are different. Do you know that if I'm interviewing somebody, let's say they have information from somebody they implicitly trust, then that information is entirely false, but they're telling it to me. Are they going to show the signs of deception? Are they going to show the cues? No. So he said, my job is not some circus sideshow that I can tell who's lying and who's not. It's to find the truth because there are still lives on the line. I will never forget that, right? And I think that's something that would be great for all of us to, to strive for, is know that being right and finding the truth are different things. You will seek different things if you prove you're trying to prove yourself to be right than actually trying to find the truth. So the cross. Nobody has ever, to this day, been able to prove it either a forgery or authentic. If you go to the J. Paul Getty Museum tomorrow and look in their catalog, it will say, cross, Greek, date, about 530 BC, or a modern forgery. We're not quite sure. <laughs> With that, I'm going to open up the floor for Q&A for a little bit. I think we have about 10 or 12 minutes or so um, for you to ask anything you like. I get to travel the country and do some really awesome things. I get to interview a lot of interesting people, sometimes famous, um, a lot of white collar criminals, things like that. Um, but if you have any questions at all or anything that you'd like to discuss, please ask. Go ahead. 
Well, thank you for coming first. Yeah, and, thank you for uh, having me. Uh, I will ask, so in daily life, like how can you practice or how are you aware of those kind of mistakes you've been made? Because you speak so for like something, we just assume that that's the way it is, but how are we going to find that's not the, necessarily the way? Like um, how life? will you ferret out your assumptions, yeah. right? Yeah. Which ones are false? Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's, here's kind of a model that you, you might be able to use. Um, here's a way to think about it. Right, so if we have the, the top two, the very logical assumptions, right, you can find out if those assumptions are incorrect by doing a linear, just an objective view of the facts, right, asking yourself the question, are you starting with the same set of facts as others? Right? Um, your emotional level, right, some of these are pre-conscious, right, you might not be aware of them. And this is where I think it's very important to have other people to talk to that, will, that you don't feel defensive with, that will point out your uh, biases. Because um, by definition, if we're saying that these are uh, subconscious or pre-conscious, you're not aware of them. Um, so other people can see them uh, more easily than you can. And that's why culture and organizations is so important when it comes to this. Uh, if you have a culture where everybody is defensive, um, problems are, n are not gonna be solved very easily, right? Um, so this would be um, your, your beliefs, right? Kind of like the idea of Richard Jewell, if you think that the motivation is beliefs. Now, how would you, how would you ferret that out? Talk to others and also qu question yourself, challenge yourself, um, what if I'm wrong, right? Um, and not only, not only to say what if I'm wrong, but try to prove yourself wrong. Um, that takes a lot of courage, um, but in a, uh, that you know that you're getting closer to the truth every time you prove yourself wrong. Then there is the deeply subconscious um, conditioned assumptions like reading the words when I told you not to. That really requires somebody else pointing them out to you. And I've described it like Pavlov's dogs. It's, an associational response that you can't help. Um, almost always the best way to do that is to have somebody else point that out to you. Ask other people that you trust um, what they think about your views on the problem. That's usually where the biggest problems lie is on the deepest subconscious assumptions. I hope that helps. Yes. I, I, I thought of this question during the card um, experiment. Yeah. And so to prove, to prove a hypothesis wrong, you just need one example that does so. Um, however, um, in terms of the scientific method and uh, experimentation and all that, the closest that we can get to proving something is true is through replication and separate um, circumstances and separate testing. So because we can prove things wrong definitively, but can't necessarily definitively prove something right, should we focus more on trying to find evidence that disconfirms something as opposed to supporting evidence that does um, confirm it? I think that's, uh, that's an excellent question. Um, uh, part of that, um, too, that you were mentioning is that I, I think we need to challenge ourselves to the extent that uh, you even question whether you can definitively prove anything Right? Because you need to question the validity, the reliability of the evidence that you're looking at. Um, it, the evidence might point you in, in the wrong direction, so you might, might believe something that just isn't the case in either direction. But I think that's where the, the signal to noise ratio comes in, and that's where professional judgment comes into play because it's, um, it's really difficult because it's gonna vary by the situation. Right? And I think uh, when it comes to each situation, your biases are going to be a little bit different in that situation. Um, saying that, I think two things. One, what I mentioned to the young, young lady here, have somebody else point those out to you. Um, second thing I will mention is, yes, I do bend towards um, forcing myself to look for disconfirming evidence because I know that normally we look for confirmation, right? We more easily fall prey to confirmation bias 
So I do push myself a little more towards uh, disconfirmation, especially of my own assumptions. Right? So I hope that makes sense. Other questions? Yes, up here. Uh, so uh, you talked a lot about uh, perspective, um, especially uh, I was thinking how most of us are business majors, uh, particularly accounting majors, um, going into the workforce. Um, it's kind of like wondering with that perspective, like how we're supposed to challenge, uh, especially experts have been doing it their entire lives and we come in fresh and how we're supposed to challenge um, like accounting standards and things like that. I love that. Um, <laughs> yeah, because I see it um, so often where it should be done. So uh, a couple things that come to my mind when, when you say that. Uh, one is, um, before I directly answer that question, is kind of an idea that I want you to have in your mind. And that is the research shows that the uh, more expertise and experience someone has, right, the more bias that they're going to have in a way because they're used to seeing things a certain way. Um, and uh, the more time they spend like that, right, the more they're going to say, no, it's always this way, just then they're going to try to shortcut things. Right? Novices, uh, new people in an industry, are more likely to see um, the strange, the unusual, uh, correlations that you normally wouldn't think would happen. Right? Uh, so to your question, um, how do you challenge them? Uh, I would, and this isn't always easy, but what I would do is uh, pay very careful attention to the culture of where you go work. Um, and this is, this is just a, a fact of life, a reality that's very, very difficult because it's hard to know that. Uh, and that's going to be a decision that you're going to have to make when you're faced with it, is whether you are going to potentially ignore something that you know shouldn't be ignored. Uh, and you're going to have uh, levels, right? There are lines that you won't cross. Um, and define those well, and don't, don't bend them. Um, because I, I see it, it happens every day. Uh, when you are in industry, I promise you, it's going to happen to you constantly. Um, and it's easier for um, seniors to um, not have the problems that, like, if you notice something, right, um, in the accounting environment, audit environment, uh, if you notice something, guess what? It's going to take more work and time, uh, billable hours that maybe they don't want to spend, and they're going to just wish that you didn't see it. Know in your mind what's okay with you and what's not. Uh, and when it comes to that point, call it out. Um, and if that means going to work somewhere else, please do that. Um, and of course, you know, I mean, interpersonal skills are going to come into play as far as how you're, you're going to talk to them about, uh, tell them your concerns um, and see how they react without making any um, strong statements, because I have seen some people say it's like, well, I'm, you know, I saw this, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to stand this. I'm not going to work under this. And, and you could be wrong, right? Hear them out, see what their response is, you know, um, before you make that decision. But, um, but I think that's an incredibly important thing for everybody to think about before they get into industry. So thank you for that question. Other question? I think we have time maybe for one more. Right? No. Nope. That do it? All right. Thank Excellent. You so much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.